on World News Tonight. Bakhmut battle. Following a series of defeats against Ukraine, Russian forces attempt to cover more ground in other strategic locations. Historic benchmark. U.S. House Dems choose Hakim Jeffries to succeed as their new leader. Showing power. China may soon be the pinnacle of the nuclear nations with weapons production ramping up. And tis the season. The iconic Rockefeller Center Christmas tree officially kicks off Christmas time in New York. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And we start off tonight with updates on the Ukraine and Russia conflict. The many Russian soldiers have moved from Kherson to the eastern Donetsk region, where Moscow claims it has captured two Ukrainian villages near Bakhmut. The city, which has been partially destroyed by missile strikes, remains under Kyiv's control amid tense fighting. In the east of Ukraine, Russia is continuing to keep up pressure on the city of Bakhmut. It's one of the few areas where Moscow is still on the offensive. Meanwhile, in his nightly address, the Ukrainian president responded to comments made by Elon Musk in October that Ukraine should give up some territory to Russia to end the war. Vladimir Zelensky suggested that someone may have influence over the billionaire and that the destruction wrought speaks for itself. He said, I'm always being open. If you want to understand what Russia has done here, come to Ukraine and you will see this with your own eyes. After that, you will tell us how to end this war, who started it and when we can end it. Meanwhile, telecom engineers are busy trying to keep communication lines open after Russian strikes took out electricity across the country. They're now fueling generators to provide power to mobile phone towers. A Ukrainian engineer said, I know that our guys, my colleagues, are very exhausted, but they are very motivated by the fact that what we are doing is an important thing. Now, unfortunately, there is war in Ukraine. And away from the war-torn country, the Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska visited the Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral of the Holy Family in exile in London with King Charles. They opened a new Ukrainian welcome center which will help displaced families in the country. The United Nations and partners launched an appeal for a record $51.5 billion in aid of money for 2023 with tens of millions of additional people expected to need humanitarian assistance, including those in Ukraine and displaced by the Russian invasion. The European Union wants Russia to be accountable for the crimes committed in Ukraine. The president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has proposed the creation of a specialized court backed by the United Nations to investigate and prosecute Russian crimes. The creation of this court has been asked several times by the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky. Russia must pay for its horrific crimes including for its crime of aggression against a sovereign state. A new law is also under preparation in order to use the Russian frozen assets for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Russia must also pay financially for the devastation that it caused. The damage suffered by Ukraine is estimated at 600 billion euros. Russia and its oligarchs have to compensate Ukraine for the damage and cover the costs for rebuilding the country. And we have the means to make Russia pay. So far, 300 billion euros of the Russian central bank reserves and 19 billion euros of Russian oligarchs' money are being kept on ice. This doesn't mean all this money can be used, though. The new laws won't work retroactively and the money that would really be confiscated should be linked to actual and proven crimes by specific individuals. President Joe Biden's welcoming of French President Emmanuel Macron at the first White House state visit is being celebrated by both countries. But despite their understanding, Washington and Paris do not see everything eye to eye. President Macron, it is my pleasure, my great pleasure to welcome you to Washington, D.C. and to NASA headquarters. 
French President Emmanuel Macron on Wednesday met with U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and laid a wreath at Arlington National Cemetery, all part of his high-profile trip to the U.S. as the first foreign leader feted with an official state visit by President Joe Biden. It's an event aimed at recognizing France's status as America's oldest ally, with Biden administration officials stressing America's unwavering support for its partners around the globe and the importance of alliances in confronting global challenges. Here's National Security Advisor John Kirby. I mean, if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, look at what's going on in the Indo-Pacific and the tensions with China, France is really at the center of all those things. The visit also highlights the unique way that Macron has raised France's profile on the world stage, and particularly in the United States. Since he swept to power in 2017, Macron has launched a flurry of international initiatives that have made him one of the most active global leaders. From Beirut to Bangkok, and from the Kremlin to the White House, he has sought to place himself at the center of every crisis, with a flair for seizing the moment, which he tried to do with the vice president at NASA. We do share this history, we do have the same commitment and attachment to science and progress, but we do share as well the same democratic values. Right now, 2022, the French-American relation is good. Nicole Baccarin is a French historian. She says the American and French leaders have far more tying them together than pulling them apart, especially compared with Biden's predecessor. Everybody remembers that uh, Emmanuel Macron tried to soften somehow uh, Donald Trump, and that it didn't work out. The Biden um, White House is a friendly White House towards Europe. I mean, Biden is an old internationalist, and uh, Emmanuel Macron, who is such a European leader as such, there is a, a good basis to understand each other. Despite that understanding, Washington and Paris do not see everything eye to eye. Macron has advocated a less confrontational approach with Beijing than Biden, and the leaders may disagree about the desired endgame in Ukraine. U.S. House Democrats chose caucus chairman Hakeem Jeffries of New York to succeed Nancy Pelosi as leader of the Democrats in the chamber next year, a historic move that will make him the first black person to lead one of the two major parties in either chamber of Congress. It's an honor to stand before you today. Democrats on Wednesday unanimously elected Hakeem Jeffries to serve as the party's top leader in the House of Representatives, replacing Nancy Pelosi to become the first black American to hold such a high-ranking position in Congress. At a news conference, the 52-year-old New Yorker acknowledged his 82-year-old predecessor, who in 2007 was the first woman to be elected House Speaker. I also want to convey my thanks to Speaker Nancy Pelosi, an extraordinary speaker for the ages, who has delivered so much for so many over such a significant period of time. Our caucus is better, our country is better, the world is better because of Speaker Nancy Pelosi's incredible leadership. Pelosi announced on November 17th that she would give up her leadership role after Republicans secured a slim majority in the chamber following the midterm elections. Jeffrey said he will aim to work with Republicans when he officially takes the helm of the Democratic caucus beginning in January. We look forward to finding opportunities to partner with the other side of the aisle and work with them whenever possible. But we will also push back against extremism whenever necessary. With Republicans in control of the House next year, leader Kevin McCarthy, who is set to become the next speaker in January, said his party would push for deep cuts in spending and launch investigations into President Joe Biden and his son, Hunter. Still in the U.S., parts of Alabama are mourning the dead and many are staggering to recover from the unusual November tornado outbreak across the Deep South. At least 33 tornadoes were reported across four states, with a remarkable 70 tornado warning issued across the South in the United States. Experts say that the late season outbreak appended the calendar as climate change rewrites weather patterns in real time. In the brutal aftermath of this tornado outbreak, the community of Flatwood, Alabama took the hardest hit. A powerful system that produced at least 33 reported tornadoes across four states, leaving thousands without power and claiming two lives in this home, a 39-year-old mother and her 8-year-old son. 
the tree was down, they couldn't get in. I took my phone and started waving it to them, like over here. And they kind of climbed and we, I helped them pull the limbs. Nearby, this neighborhood church has become a refuge. Almost every member was impacted. Parts of the South are now littered with the telltale signs of potential tornadoes and sightings from Panama Beach to Jackson County, Alabama. In Caledonia, Mississippi, this is what's left of a fire station. Nearby, Richard White's family home suffered the same fate. They had an fire going on. Yep, it, it was pretty rough. Tonight, as the National Weather Service continues to survey the damage, experts say it's giving way to a disturbing trend, tornado season stretching later into the year. It's going to short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, as Prince William and Kate arrived in Boston, there's controversy back in England. A long-time confidant to Queen Elizabeth II resigned after she questioned a black charity boss about her heritage. As William and Catherine arrived in Boston, reintroducing themselves to America as Prince and Princess of Wales, a new racism row back home again threatens the reputation of the royal family. Prince William's godmother, a long-time confidant to Queen Elizabeth, resigning a new role as aide to Queen Camilla after she questioned a black charity boss about her heritage at a Buckingham Palace event. Ngozi Falani tweeting the exchange with Camilla's aide, which reads in part, What nationality are you? I am born here and I'm British. No, but where do you really come from? Where do your people come from? Tonight, an eyewitness describing her shock at the exchange. If Ngozi was a white woman, that line of questioning wouldn't have taken place. But in the Caribbean this year, William and Kate were criticised for arriving in a white Land Rover and shaking hands with young people of colour through a wire fence. And in their Oprah interview, Harry and Meghan claimed a member of the royal family asked Harry what colour their child would be. There's a conversation with you? With Harry about how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially, and what that would mean or look like. That prompted this question to Prince William. Let me know, is the royal family a racist family, sir? They're very much not a racist family. The U.S. Department of Defense believes China currently has over 400 nuclear warheads, but that number is expected to jump almost three times over a decade, driven by modernization and expansion of its nuclear forces. And this comes as the COVID curbs have been eased. China will likely own a stockpile of 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035 if its nuclear development continues at the current pace. That's almost a quadruple what Beijing is known to have currently. This is according to a report by the Pentagon released on Tuesday, which says that China has continued to speed up the modernization, diversification and expansion of its nuclear weapons. The latest figure reflects mounting concerns by Washington over China's intentions to stretch out its nuclear arsenal, such as by ordering the Northern Theater Command to engage in a range of operations in the event of a crisis. That could include, according to the Pentagon, a military intervention into North Korea to secure weapons of mass destruction or preserve North Korea as a buffer state. In fact, the number of nuclear warheads that China is expected to acquire over the years could be bigger than the Pentagon expects. The expert added it could match or exceed Washington's, which is 3,750. While seeing no imminent invasion of Taiwan, the Pentagon voiced concern that China could conduct air or ground attack operations against Taiwan. China is known to spend the most money on defense in the world, followed by the U.S., but Tuesday's report pointed out that spending is much bigger with several categories not officially included in the defense budget. China sent a spacecraft carrying three astronauts to its space station for the first time in orbit crew rotation in Chinese space history, launching operation of the second inhabited outpost in low Earth orbit after the NASA-led International Space Station. Six Chinese astronauts meet in orbit for the first time, marking the final construction phase of China's Chang'ong space station. It's a milestone for its space program, paving the way towards China's long-term crew presence in space. 
This is the first ever in-orbit crew rotation for us. It'll be something regular in future space station missions. We will optimize and improve from this rotation and create a standard practice to guide us for future rotations. For years, the ISS has been the only space station in Earth's orbit. But now it'll have company, in the form of China's Heavenly Palace, or Qiangong, the name of the station. The Chinese have long been excluded from the ISS, as the US government prohibits NASA from cooperating with China. Bringing the number of astronauts in the space station to six, of course, is kind of giving the signal, well, it's ready, it's kind of built, it's ready to be used, it's ready to do the science on a, a full-fledged scale. And I think the whole world is actually watching. The three new arrivals will spend the next six months conducting dozens of experiments and tests. China also plans to launch its own space telescope next year, which will orbit with the station and occasionally dock with Chang'ong for maintenance. The Chinese space station is a lot smaller than the international one, but it has a lifespan of 10 to 15 years. So with plans for the ISS to retire in 2031, it could one day become the only human outpost in Earth's orbit. We have some good news for you. Early screening tests for pancreatic cancer has been developed by a Japanese biotech firm by using the powerful noses of tiny worms. This becomes the world's first early screening test for pancreatic cancer. These tiny worms can apparently sniff out pancreatic cancer. Japanese biotech firm Hirotsu Bioscience says it has developed the world's first early screening test for the disease. These creatures, known scientifically as C. elegans, belong to a family of nematodes. Their noses are much more powerful than dogs. Hirotsu Bioscience says that makes the tiny animal a potent diagnostic tool as they can follow their nose toward cancer cells. CEO and founder of Hirotsu Bioscience, Taaki Hirotsu, has been researching the tiny worms for 28 years. Hirotsu Bio launched its first end-nose pancreas test directly to consumers in Japan in January 2020. Users send a urine sample to a lab where it is put in a petri dish with the nematodes. The company said the test had the ability to tell if users were at a high risk of cancer or not. About 250,000 people have taken the original test, with about 5-6% to getting high-risk readings. In November 2022, Hirotsu Bio launched a new version of the test, tweaking the genetic code of the nematodes so that they swim away from pancreatic cancer samples. The pancreas test kit costs up to 70,000 yen, or about $500. The company hopes to bring the test to the United States by 2023. In the coming years, it expects to roll out targeted tests for liver cancer, as well as cervical and breast cancers. But it isn't without criticism. Some doctors have criticised Hirotsu Bio's direct approach to consumers and doubted the medical usefulness of the results. The company counters that the accuracy of Ennos stands up well against other diagnostic tests and are intended as early screening tools that can guide patients to further testing and treatment sooner. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Elon Musk said that he expects a wireless brain chip development by his company Neuralink to begin human clinical trials in six months after the company missed earlier timelines set by himself. New Delhi residents continue to breathe polluted air as the air quality in New Delhi hovered in the very poor category. The world's most polluted capital city struggles to breathe easy every winter as cool temperatures and calm winds trap pollutants closer to the ground. More than halfway through the Artemis 1 mission, NASA's Orion spacecraft is set to begin its return journey to Earth. The top objective was to test the durability of Orion's heat shield as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere at 24,500 miles. New York City Mayor Eric Adams rolled out a plan to allow more mentally ill homeless people to be hospitalized against their will in order to tackle a crisis. 
The baguette, which is a symbol of France as the Eiffel Tower, has gained UNESCO recognition as the UN body voted to include the artisanal know-how and culture of baguette bread on its list of intangible cultural heritage. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, as Christmas month begins, everyone is finally getting into the festive spirit. Crowds gathered in New York City's Midtown Manhattan for the 90th annual lighting of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, officially kicking off the holiday season. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.